I upload to YouTube, I'll go ahead and start. Welcome, everybody, to this very special class here, um, gardening to attract beneficial insects, to do all kinds of wonderful things. Now, to start, I would kind of like to break this down a lot like I did my last class when I talked about beneficial animals. Um, I'm first going to talk a little bit about the specific um, different types of insects, arthropods, etc. Break those down into groups, explain why they're useful, explain why they would be beneficial, of course, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to attract them to your garden. So, beneficial insects, arthropods, smaller organisms, I like to classify into four different types of groups. Number one are going to be your pollinators. Number two are going to be your predators. Three is going to be your parasites. And four is going to be your decomposers. And now all of them play drastically different roles. All of them are super important in a garden setting or even in a landscape setting. Um, and I'd like to kind of run through that. So let's start with that first one I mentioned, pollinators. Is the classic one that people usually talk about when they when they mention beneficial insects, you generally think of honeybees or other kinds of pollinators, like we have a bunch of native flies. Even some pollinators can be beetles or, um, heck, even some wasps every once in a while. Um, but they are, of course, the most well-known beneficial insect and also some of the easiest ones to harm with chemical uh, use or just even if you spray like, the hose directly on them, you can damage and kill them. It's unfortunate, but it is true. They may not be the strongest. But, of course, you have your honeybees. I mentioned you have those flies, even some beetles. All of these are little insects, organisms that are feeding off of the sugary pollen on some of the flowers that they are um, attracted to. And then bringing that and continuously feeding to different flowers on different plants. Fairly simple process. I'm sure that most everybody is aware of this, um, but the same thing works for not just with honeybees. I'll talk about flies. They do the same thing. Um, honeybees are definitely attracted to more of those bright colors, more of those sweet scents. Um, if, you're, if you're a fly or beetle that's pollinating, then you are going to be attracted to a kind of darker, more red, or even black or brown type flower. And a lot of times, um, the pollinators for these darker flowers are also attracted to more acrid stenches. Um, they do not like the sweet stench. They're going to be uh, going after more of those almost like dead body type stinks. And, you know, it's that's the way life works. It's got to get pollinated. That's how the plant and the insect has evolved together in order to create that symbiosis. But um, that's kind of a real rough go of just the pollinators there because I don't want to dive too much into the specific insects since this class is more about attracting them. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about predators. Predatorial insects are those um, well, not even insects, but, you know, there's other clades there. But predatorial organisms are those that will attack in other types of insects, obviously. And the best thing to do in a case like this is, of course, going to be looking at what they are attacking. Uh, beneficial predatorial insects are going to be feeding off of other insects that would damage plant material, um, would cause damage to, um, of course, trees as well, garden beds, even have issues with harming you as a person. And some good examples of this are, of course, going to be your um, predatory spiders. Spiders are great predators on killing, you know, flies or even, even snails and slugs sometimes. Um, they will also eat off of some of the aphids, some of the, the leaf-sucking insects like aphids or scale. Sometimes they will attack um, some of the wasps as well. Really, um, it depends on the type of spiders. Spiders can either be hunters and will go directly out, not really using their webs as a trap, but actually go out and find insects to eat. Um, they can also lay traps. 
like, of course, the webs that we're all familiar with, or they could even lay kind of trip wires with their webs as well. And then finally, spiders can uh, be solitary and stay in one place, wait for vibrations, sounds, or anything to happen around where they're staying, and then jump out and capture what they need. Um, spiders are not the only predator, definitely not. Uh, lady beetles are another terrific predator. Ladybugs, same thing. Um, and actually, the ladybug that we all know and love, the classic looking kind of spotted one, is not even the form of ladybug that does the most damage, not by a long shot. The larval form of the ladybug, which I'm about to show you a picture of, is the one that is actually actively um, and aggressively eating insects and, uh, and destroying some of the, um, the plant pests that are becoming a problem. Here's the picture, by the way, right here. Right here. That is a ladybug. That is a larval ladybug. They look terrifying, but they are so good at their job. They are terrific at destroying some of these, um, again, plant pests, going around and just being ridiculous hunters. Now, when you buy ladybugs for your garden, for your crop, for your, um, for even for some of your house plants, or you're trying to use beneficial insects, you will get them in their adult form, and a lot of times they will not do as much feeding as you're liking. The real thing that you want to have happen are to buy the or to buy these ladybugs and have them lay eggs around the general area that you're having the problem, because once those eggs hatch, they'll turn into that larval state, and then they'll start to actually take down some of the population. So just be careful and take it with a grain of salt when you're purchasing lady beetles, ladybugs, because they are not going to be eating as much as you're liking. Their larval will. Um, that is, uh, again, another example of a predator. Um, another one would be the green lacewing. Uh, it's kind of small. It's, it's hard to really see. It has a kind of a glimmering type shine to it. Um, they're really good at eating, <coughs> excuse me, they're very good at eating aphids as well as some other kind of mealy like insects or scale. Um, a lot of those insects that have those piercing sucking mouth parts that inject into the leaf and we'll just uh, soak up the sugars there. By the way, um, as a reference for a lot of this, I am using the CSU extension, um, Beneficial Insects. Uh, CSU extension is terrific for all kinds of landscape and garden ideas. This one was personally written by uh, Whitney Cranshaw, who, shout out Whitney Cranshaw, if you ever have a chance to talk to him, he is the coolest. And I would say that Fall Street Nursery heavily endorses him as an entomologist. Not that I don't think he needs it, but he's a great source. Um, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just mention one more uh, predatory insect, and then I'll move on to the parasitic insects. But um, the last one I'd like to talk about are going to be the, some of the true bugs. Now, a lot of times we use the term bug as kind of this blanket or general term to describe all kinds of insects and arthropods and um, arachnids, but it is actually, the broader term is insect. Insects, of course, will have six legs, and they will have very specific amounts of body parts, either piercing, sucking mouth parts or chewing mouth parts, um, but True bugs are a very specific type of insect, very specific type. So um, their order, not that it really matters with all this Latin here, but uh, their order is Hemiptera. And true bugs are often very round. They can be maybe a quarter inch to an inch, depending on the family. Again, I'm being very general here. Um, but they will always have those piercing, sucking mouth parts. And what I mean by that is like an aphid, they, their mouth essentially is this long tube like a mosquito, but of course it's not biting us. And the tube falls under the body, and when it's ready to eat, it'll come out and then poke whatever it is trying to eat, of course. So um, predatory bugs are going to be those that use that piercing, sucking mouth part, and inject that into your plant um, pests, Again, I keep using aphid as an example. It's just a terrific one to use because everyone's familiar with it. Um, they'll inject and then essentially 
suck out all of the the blood and guts to be unfortunately grotesque um of whatever is feeding on your plants so now i'd like to move into a little bit about the plant um the parasitic insects and the classic example of this are going to be what is called parasitoid wasps these are wasps that will never hurt you your family any mammal any bird these are specifically geared to harm um, other kind of plant feeding insects. Um, parasitoid wasps um, are often shaped very similarly to the wasps that you may be more familiar with. However, um, the major difference is going to be their stinger. So instead of having your typical um, kind of small sharp stinger with the barb on the end, what these parasitoid wasps have is a massive what is called an ovipositor and an ovipositor is going to be um, a very needle-like structure on the end of the wasp that can actually be very variable in size some parasitoid wasps only have um, an ovipositor a couple inches however some especially ones that like to attack insects that bore into trees those parasitoid wasps will have those Again, those ovipositors, those back of the back of the body needles, that could be two, three, four times their size, the insect size. Um, so, what's the point? What, what is this ovipositor? What does it do? How is it helping? Well, um, I will use that example of uh, boring insects, um, ones that will bore into the wood of trees and start to eat away at the uh, live tissue in there. The parasitoid wasps, wasps will go um, up to that hole in the tree. They'll take the ovipositor, they'll stick it in to the hole of the tree where that boring insect had gone in. Um, from there, it will poke the insect and inject its own eggs into the borer. Now from there, once those eggs hatch in a very grotesque way, those larvae will eat away at the borer. And uh, eventually when they're ready, they will exit out through the hole what, when, which they were from and start the process all over again. Now, that is a very parasitic way of doing this. The ovipositor, exactly, yes, very, very, that, that's a good reaction. Um, the ovipositor will inject those eggs and then the babies act as a parasite to the insect that is harming the tree, harming the plant material. Now, it's this, of course, is not just boring insects. Parasitoid wasps will attack a wide range um, of insects, and they will have different body parts to kind of hone in and be specific as to what their prey is. That is just a great example um, of one. So not all wasps are bad. Some are very helpful in the garden, in the landscape, and otherwise. Now, I would like to, after kind of talking about some of those parasites, talk a little bit more about the decomposers, which are, in my opinion, the unsung heroes of the landscape. These are going to be like your roller polies, millipedes, worms, springtails, even earwigs. Um, these are all insects that will feed on decaying matter, organic matter, um, and as they're excreting it, actually create a nice kind of compost or will actually give um, the plant some material, this bio um, available material for the plant to take up and use as kind of a fertilizer. Um, they are also main components in creating compost, breaking what you're adding to the compost down and um, truly composting it, for lack of a better word. Um, and again, uh, they may not look the coolest, but they certainly are very helpful, and they are one of the reasons why um, plants in the landscape can be as healthy as they are. If without decomposers, fungus would take over the entire world. And the issue is, especially in the forest landscape, if you have these, you know, if these animals and insects that are dying onto the ground, you have leaves that are falling down off the trees, branches, all these things would just pile up and sit there. They might get broken down by fungus, which is nice, but after a while, things still need to get eaten and processed and turned back into that soil, or else it'll just become a big fungusy and kind of wet, gross stench, this mess all over the ground. So decomposers are extremely helpful. 
Um, the most common one is, of course, going to be worms. And worms, uh, night crawlers, otherwise, are going to be extremely proficient in turning this broken down, decaying matter into actually usable, um, usable fertilizer, food for the plant, and um, kind of just make everything a little bit healthier in the landscape. Now, excuse me. <coughs> now that we've talked about different kind of areas of insects that are beneficial, um, pollinators, predators, parasitite, parasites, and decomposers, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to attract them to your lawn through using specific gardening techniques. Now, for pollinators, fairly easy, something that most people are familiar with, planting a lot of wildflowers, planting bright colors, um, or plants that have bright colored flowers, planting um, especially native plants to your area are going to be very important. These are, of course, going to be easily recognized by the pollinators as something that, yes, I, I want to eat the, the pollen off of that. I'm very familiar with this plant. And also, a lot of your native plants are less cultivated, which is a good thing because super cultivated plants, let's use uh, roses, for example. The classic rose nowadays is a multi double petaled rose that you can't even really see any reproductive parts in. You can't see any stamens, stigmas, there's no pollen that you can really even see from them. But if you look back to more of those wild roses, more of a prickly rose, it's only single petals. You only have one line of petals on the outside, and in the middle you have your stamen, stigma, you have all of the reproductive parts, which is what those pollinators are actually looking for. Same thing can be said with like peonies or even uh, some petunias, um, dahlias, these things that have been so cultivated that they will, their bright colors will attract pollinators. There's nothing wrong with that, but they don't provide any food because the petals have essentially overtaken any uh, food source, any reproductive part of the flower. So planting natives, um, especially those that are less cultivated, planting bright colors, and then having a good variety of species and genera and families of plants is going to be important. If you decided that you wanted to plant a rose bush as well as a ice plant, as well as a crab apple, and maybe even threw a service berry in there, all four of those are in the exact same family um, called Rosaceae, the rose family. And while they would be great, you generally want to have some diversity in your planting. Um, there are certain rules put in place for this, but I would just say just keep a healthy diversity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever tell anybody to plant 30% of this, 20% of that, 10% of this. It, it, there's no need in, in, in a landscape, in real, in real life, for, to have that kind of very permanent and written in stone diversity. Um, so, anyway. Having a nice diversity, having light colors, even sweet smelling flowers is going to be great for attracting some of your uh, pollinators. Now I'll talk a little bit about the predators. Um, predatory insects, we had mentioned spiders, lady beetles, lace wings, all these things are going to be devouring, eating, or damaging the, um, the insects that are causing plant problems. These are easily um, brought in with the issue without any really further um, any further elaboration on that. If there are aphids present, if there is some sort of plant pest present, that is when those predators are going to come in. If you don't have anything, then there's no reason really for them to be there. Of course, if you look hard enough in a landscape and in a greenhouse and any plant, you will find that there is maybe a little insect here or there. If it's, if it's bad, it will be more noticeable. But the more of a problem you have, the more predators will actually show up for that. Now, that's not the only way to attract them, is to invite all these, pro all these um, plant problems and insect problems to your landscape. Another good way to bring them in would be to give them a place to hang out to be. Um, a lot of plant predators will be active at night, and providing them a kind of low 
not necessarily wet, but moist and covered area would always be beneficial. And this could be as easy as creating um, a little pond. This is something I brought up in my last class about attracting toads and birds. But creating these little kind of aquifers, these small wet areas around your landscape to attract some of these would be great. Um, even if you have, if you've mulched some of your, um, some of your plants, a lot of these predators that otherwise would dry out in the sun would like to hide underneath there and kind of stay present and dormant or sleep, I would say, stay asleep until the next day. Um, or even just providing a lush kind of environment for them to hide out in until nighttime comes, it's cooler, and then they can do their feeding. Um, it's a lot easier to attract things like your parasitic um, wasps or any of your parasitic insects by creating what are called insect hotels. And these structures almost look like um, birdhouses with a roof, um, but they don't necessarily have to be. Really what a lot of these parasitoid insects want, especially some of the wasps, are these, wish I had an example, are going to be long kind of wooden tubes with holes on either end. They don't even have to be closed on, open on both ends, one end can be closed, but I would suggest anybody who is listening to this at the moment or at any time in the future, look up insect hotels or specifically parasitoid wasp hotels. You'll find that a lot of these are full of those just kind of long, skinny, wooden tubes um, that are just taking up most of the area in your birdhouse. So, roof, and then wooden tubes. I do not sell those, unfortunately. I would love to get some in, and I'm actually about to place an order for some of them, um, but a lot of those uh, are very easily DIY'd, um, too. But that is a great question. I'm thinking I will get some of those in because they have become much more popular over the past couple of years. So anyway, that's a little bit about those hotels to try and attract some of those parasitoid wasps to your area. And then decomposers are very easy to attract. Um, it's just a matter of adding organic matter to your soil. If you're adding compost or if you're adding, um, or if you're adding uh, any kind of natural amendment like a blood meal, a bone meal, a cottonseed meal, anything that can be broken down. Um, granular fertilizers are not really meant to be broken down because they are already in the form that they are bioavailable to the plant. Um, wood chips, again, compost, any of anything that has a meal on the end of it, cotton seed meal, bone meal, um, even like some kind of potash, any amendments like that are very helpful in attracting decomposers to break those materials down. Um, this is, I'm going to add a little thing here. If you ever have, excuse me, <coughs> if you ever have fungus gnats in your houseplants or on your houseplants at all, it is more than likely, thank you so much, it is more than likely because you have organic matter in whatever soil you're using or whatever media you're using for your houseplants. Like if you use an all-purpose natural soil or media or if you're using a natural or an organic media for your houseplants, they have a lot of these organic compounds, these natural compounds that are not bioavailable and need to get broken down. So fruit flies are another decomposer. They feed off of decomposing matter. So buying a very synthetic media that, that strictly has like peat moss or coconut core and perlite or vermiculite, things that aren't wood chips or aren't compost that don't need to be broken down is one of the best ways to avoid having any fruit flies in your, uh, in, on your house plants. Because the more organic, the more natural you buy for media, the more fruit flies you're going to end up with. It's unfortunate, but it's what happens. Of course, there are ways to get rid of that, but that's not what the class is. So, I kind of went through about pollinators, how it's important to pick a nice diversity, um, even having some native plants in the area to bring these bright colors, these um, very nice scents to your landscape to attract some of the pollinators. Um, then you have those predators, which of course you would like to create a kind of wet or dark or just kind of this very um, almost 
cold oasis for them, either in the brush of other plants or underneath mulch. Um, your parasite, your parasitic insects love those bug hotels, of course, having those wooden tubes. You don't have to necessarily have a hotel either. You can have, like, if, if you have breakage on a tree one year and you don't want to bring that to the dump, you can take it and drill in the holes into the log and it will be used at, in the same way. And then I talked about decomposers in which you would add a lot of organic matter to the soil um, in any form as, like I mentioned, compost, natural fertilizers, or any kind of amendment that is a meal. Um, there are other examples, but I just won't delve too deep into that. Um, but I guess this is the point uh, where I would love to ask if anybody has any questions for me um, while I'm still here, either about specific insects in either pollinators, predators, parasites, or decomposers, or if anybody has any questions about um, encouraging them to your landscape a bit more, I'd be happy to answer them as of now. I'm going to take a drink of this water real quick um, and just see if anybody has anything. Are there any beneficial ants? That is a terrific question. And while there definitely are, um, not too many of them live around here. Any beneficial ants would, of course, fall into that predatory category because they have chewing mouth parts. Um, unfortunately, I cannot tell you the specific name of the, 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 the mouth parts that they have up front. Um, but yes, there definitely are. Um, the ones that are going into your home or are kind of around some of your plants aren't necessarily going to be the most beneficial, but they're not eating your uh, plants is, is pretty important. The only ant that I'm familiar with that actually does anything to plants is a leaf cutter ant, and it's very similar to a leaf cutter bee, in which if you look at a leaf, it will cut out perfect circles on the edges or around the margins of that leaf. Um, they are also fairly proficient at finding sugars, but not necessarily on flowers. What you might see is ants up in trees, actually, um, especially if there are aphids on the tree or any kind of insect that is taking the sugars out of the leaf and then excreting them. Those sugars will drop down to the next leaf, and ants really love those sugars. They will climb up the tree and start harvesting the sugar off of the leaf where they were. Um, but that is a terrific question. I wish I can give you a specific family of ants or a specific kind that I'm aware of around here. But for the most part, they like to defend their own territory. They like to feed off of sugar that they don't have to climb onto flowers for. And um, they will a lot of times just harvest um, some food every once in a while. If you have, uh, if you drop anything outside or you're kind of near compost, and nothing's broken up into anything larger than a crumb, they'll bring that back to their colony and, you know, eat with it. But, of course. Any other questions while I'm still up here? Alrighty. Well, I think if that's going to be it, I'm going to go ahead and end the live video here. I really appreciate everybody for coming in. Again, shout out to Whitney Cranshaw. If you ever have any entomology questions, I would look up CSU Extension, uh, specifically articles that he's written. Um, thank you very much. Also, shout out to Botany Babe, who has been very interactive this class. Really appreciate it. You guys are the best. I love doing these classes. And... Hopefully I'll be able to see you again here in the next week. So thanks, guys. Have a great day.